Katie Reif. I am a member of the Chicago Film Critics Association. I host a monthly series here called The Music Box of Horrors. And I am very, very excited to bring back to the stage the director of Birth Rebirth, Laura Moss. We've been asked for you to sit here for filming purposes. So I saw this movie at Sundance, and Sundance Film Festival has like a hybrid component now, where as a critic you can watch movies at home. So I want you to know I watched this movie at midnight at home by myself, and there was no one else home, and I was like pacing my apartment because I was like, I have to talk to someone about this movie. <laughs> So I'm very happy that it's finally transpired that you're here in Chicago and we can finally talk about it with all these nice people. Let's give it up for Laura. Awesome. Thank you very much. So I kind of wanted to start out, you know, um, you mentioned in the intro that this story's been with you for a long time since you first read Frankenstein. How long has it existed in this current form where you have, you know, the pathologist and the nurse and the child? Well, yeah, I was thinking about it really since I read Frankenstein, and I think the question that came up immediately for me was, you know, what if Victor Frankenstein was a woman, but like, what if a character that was obsessed with creating life with her mind kind of had to reckon with her body mm -hmm. in order to do it? And it was like a weird question that haunted my nightmares through like years of my 20s. And sure. then I started writing these journal entries that were letters from prison from the perspective of this doctor, like justifying her experiments to the mother of the child who she had been with. Oh wow, so okay. In that version, she was clearly caught and was, and it was just a way, I think, to explore the psychology of this character. Mm -hmm. And then I put it away. Uh, you know, my co-writer, Brendan O'Brien and I, who, who do all our work together, uh, had made some shorts, we'd written a feature that was pretty major in scope, and we were facing the reality that it wasn't gonna be our first one, because yeah. no one was gonna finance it. Uh, and we were like, oh, what can we do that's more contained, that only takes place with a few characters and a few locations? And I dug up these, these letters, and I was like, is there anything here? And he's like, well, it's not a movie, but like, <laughs> I've never, I've never seen it before, and so, and so it was really kind of taking that inspiration. Mm -hmm. That's what led us to the script. Awesome. So, you know, I think the character of Celie, the nurse, is a very interesting character, and and the way her arc goes is you're dealing with these ideas of like devoted motherhood, but you're not doing it in this really sappy way that normally the idea of motherly love is portrayed in popular culture. Um, how, what were your conversations with Judy about that, and what was kind of your thought there about how you wanted to portray this mother's intense, fierce love for her child in this kind of dark context? Well, it's funny, you know, on set, Marin was, they were both so good with AJ, our, our six-year-old actress, and Marin was so sweet and very, you know, like, you know, do you need help? Are you worried about anything? Can we, can we, uh, you know, is anything I'm making you uncomfortable? And like, just constantly checking in with AJ. And Judy was like, we doing this now? You know, and, and, uh, and I, and we were in the edit and my editor was like, does Judy like, not like kids? And I'm like, no, Judy has kids. Like, <laughs> it's like you know, Judy, Judy has a child that a, a little older than, than, than AJ in the movie, like she was perfectly kind and lovely, but I do think there's this practical element to motherhood that has, I think, often been sanitized in film, and she and I talked a lot about that in the process of making this movie. You know, she's a character that's very career-driven and very action-oriented, um, and, and I think the thing that makes that character the most uncomfortable is sort of sitting in contemplation or like stillness. Um, and that was like a really fundamental character trait that that helped us move the story forward. Yeah, and so like something we were talking about a little bit uh, while the movie was rolling is that's kind of why she jumps into action the way she does when she sees her daughter like this, you know, because I think that's a reaction that is very practical. It's like, oh, good, okay, we can still solve this. <laughs> yeah, she's very solution oriented, and you know, and and something that Judy and I talked about was sort of calibrating her grief. In, in um, you know, when she first re realizes her daughter is dead, she's she's not weeping; she's in shock, and and there's and there needed to be a very large or a very significant part of her that didn't believe it, 
um, that didn't want to believe it, and so that discovering her daughter in that insane scenario um, isn't just horrifying, it's like also hopeful. I mean, it was a really important element of her, of us kind of getting her on board with Rose as quickly as we needed to for the story to go forward. Yeah, and so a lot of this movie takes place kind of in Rose's world, in Rose's apartment, and the, it's a very singular place. Like, what was kind of your strategy for putting together that space? Because it feels all out of time, almost. Yeah, yeah I mean, our, our production designers are, are, are twins, Courtney and Hilary Andahar, they're amazing. Um, and they, we talked a lot about the idea that this is, a, this is an apartment in Co-op City in the Bronx, which is a very specific feel. So we needed something that fit the bones of that but that Rose's mother lived in that apartment, they were raised in that apartment, and she died in that apartment. So we really wanted the layers of kind of mothering to be um, present there, and, the, and, and, and have kind of uh, faded, really warm touches in that apartment, and then on top of that, Rose has repurposed everything to be as practical as possible. So it's like, I've converted this into a lab space. And the Andahars, I mean, what's, I remember my DP saying this, like, it's, it's amazing to be in such a small space that we're in for so much of the movie yeah. and have every angle kind of feel different, um, which I think is crucial because it's, it's really easy for a space like that to start to get very boring. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, something that's come up a couple times already talking about the film is this idea of practicality. And I think that's of a piece with the, the medical, the kind of clinical medical aspect of this film. Um, you had a medical advisor, right? What was what was their role? Yeah, so Emily Ryan uh, was college roommates with our composer, and uh, when I Ariel, my composer, who I would love to talk about, is uh, is an old friend, and so when she first read the script, she was like, "You uh, you got to send this to Emily. Um, she's a pathologist at Stanford and specializing in gyne gynecological pathology." Oh, okay. And uh, yeah. And, and you know, we had read a few books and done some research, but by no means were we really experts. And so I did say to Emily, like, tear it apart. Like, I want to know everything that's wrong with it. And not only did she do that, but she did it in a very story-minded way. She was like, oh, this wouldn't really happen this way, but I know what you need for the story, so here's some ways that you could do that. So she was a real creative collaborator. And, years and she's a, she's a, she doesn't have any background in writing? No. no. Oh, wow. She's okay. just cool. And, and, you know, <laughs> and, and when uh, it came time to find a medical advisor, we were shooting in New Jersey, in the New York area. It was very busy. We couldn't find anyone. And I kind of went back to Emily, who had a full-time job. And I was like, would you take a few months off of work and be our medical advisor? And she was like, that sounds amazing. So she came on, and she, she was with me. When she wasn't with me, she was with the actors. She was with the production designer, with our special effects prosthetic artist, like constantly making sure that this stuff was medically accurate and they had the information they needed to do their jobs, which I think is really crucial because, you know, this is such a fantastical idea that I knew that, like, as, as grounded as the medical scenes could feel, that's, that's my only chance of you guys coming along for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's tie that in with some of the special effects. Like, to me, the image that has really been stuck in my head about this film since I've seen it is Rose's kind of wall of embryos at home. Uh, how were you creating that? Well, tell us a little bit about the special effects. Oh yeah, so I think, I think, oh man, what do we call it? We called it an apparatus in the script. Okay. There's a big serum apparatus on the windows. It's a thing with but a bunch of like cells in it. It creates, yeah. you know, eternal life. And, and so, <laughs> you know, uh, talking to Emily, I was like, all right, so I've done a little bit of research in, in to, into, um, theories of regenerative medicine, a little bit of stem cell research. Uh, you know, what, uh, what is this apparatus? <laughs> Figure out. And she did, I mean, you know, in terms of like how, how one distills serum from tissues and cells, there is an absolute logic. I can't tell you what it is. I wish you were here. But there's an absolute logic to that windowsill. Um, and, and again, I think, you know, I hope it's subliminal that like, even though I can't tell you how it works and, and, and the audience doesn't necessarily know how it works, there's a feeling that, that someone working on it knew how it works. <laughs> <laughs> so what was Emily's opinion on the pig? Oh man, uh, she loved the pig. Okay. Um, 
The pig's full name is Anjali Lakshmi Srinivasan, and she was the biggest diva. Oh my god, okay, yeah. Um, she had the biggest entourage out of anyone on the film. Uh, she's very food motivated. Uh, she wouldn't always sit down uh, when, you know, like, literally there's like a 10 minute take of just going like, Anji, sit, sit, Anji, sit, you know. And I think Brandon, my co-writer, showed it to his brother and he's like, that's how movies are made? <laughs> but I think the hardest thing about the pig that, that I really am proud of, that I hope maybe nobody noticed, which is, you know, we had to give a pig a seizure. And we weren't obviously going to do anything to uh, endanger the animal. Yeah, so, and you know, the animal struggles with Sid, so... <laughs> so, you know, I... My plan before I met this pig was, oh, we'll get the pig to lie down, someone will gently shake the pig, we'll film the pig's head, we'll film the pig's legs, it'll be shaky. Um, when I met the pig, like, pigs do lie down, but if you go near them, they get up again. Like, there's no way that you're going to be able to, like, shake a lying down pig. And so I was really stumped, and the owner of the pig was like, oh, um, I have this um, shaking plate that I use for like core exercises, and I've gotten the pig to stand on it. So she sends me this adorable video of the pig, just like, <laughs> okay, uh, we can work with this. Um, so we got the Andamars to um, build like a false floor, um, and so we had the pig standing up, shaking on the plate. We put the floor behind the pig, we put some coconut milk on the floor, so the pig's licking the, the floor and shaking. It was like a seizure. Um, but it was one of those things where I was like, I don't know if this is a good work. <laughs> and I'm so glad like no one asked me about it. I'm like, oh, I'm really glad that no one noted, realizes how hard that was. That's movie magic, folks. <laughs> well, OK, so with this film, this is like maybe a little bit of a bigger thing that I'm gonna to try to wrap my hands around while I'm explaining it. There's an idea in this film, you know, you have Rose as a pathologist and you mentioned that she has to kind of reconcile her body and her goals as a scientist. And I think that this film really presents this really radical, challenging idea of Rose. Those are her cells, she can do whatever the fuck she wants with them. She can grow stem cells to create eternal life because it is her body and she can do whatever the fuck she wants with it. And so I think it ties in with like conversations around, I don't even, I, 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 I want to say bodily autonomy, not reproductive freedom, because it's not really reproduction for her. It's, it's her way of accomplishing her goals as a scientist. And how do you think that like your ideas you're exploring in this film fit in with that conversation about bodily autonomy? It's a really big question, sorry. No, I mean, I appreciate the question. And you know, I don't shy away from saying that I'm staunchly pro-choice, um, but I really didn't want to make a political statement in this film. I think, as you mentioned, for Rose, for this character, who does all the things she does and is also a vegan, like, you know, to her, these cells are cells. And so this is a harvesting operation and there is not an emotional component for her in the movie. And, you know, I didn't want to be didactic with this film or make a statement in that way. I really wanted to be authentic to how I thought this character would behave in this situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah so the character of Rose, would you like, I think it's interesting to have a character who is a woman and a scientist and who has this lack of emotion. I think it's a really interesting thing that you're exploring in this film because I think culturally, like, there's this idea that like, oh, women are really soft and emotional, but none of the women in this film behave that way. I think they are emotional, but I, I appreciate it. I think like, you know, something I talked about with Marin a lot, who I think does a brilliant job as Rose, um, you know, she's not great at reading people. And she's not great at body language and kind of social cues. And so there's actually a huge amount of vulnerability in that. Like you, you, when you don't know how something you say is going to be perceived and you can't guess what somebody's tone of voice or body language means, um, it's pretty terrifying. And so we, so we talked about a lot about Rose's vulnerability and also maybe like, maybe if she witnessed her mother's death, her mother who she loved and was very nurturing, a real sense of, of, of guilt on Rose's part about like not being able to provide that kind of emotional support in that way to her mother. Um, 
So these were all things that I think were buzzing around in Marin's head that I think are very subtle but do show up in this movie. You know, and Celia, she's got to get it done. Like, she's incredibly warm, I think, with her daughter, but she's, but, she, but it's, yeah, I didn't want her to her come off as, as a sort of virgin mother figure as, like, saccharine or sentimental. Yeah, yeah. Um, so to pivot a little bit, you mentioned that Ariel Marx did the score for this film. Um, you said that you, you, you were already friends. So um, what was your pitch on doing the film, and what was the instruction on the mood you were trying to create with the music? Well, I was lucky. Ariel and I are like close friends, and, we, and, we, and she has done uh, my shorts before. She, she scored Friday, which played at Chicago Critics a few, quite some years ago. Um, and so we've been talking about the film for years just as friends, and she read early versions of the script before she was on the payroll for this movie. So we were talking about the tone, and I think, you know, we wanted to feel synthetic and organic at the same time, and that, that kind of dualism was really important. So she was throwing sounds my way. We were talking about different synth scores, ones we liked, ones we didn't like. We couldn't find a synth palette that we liked, so she ended up recording um, me, my mother, and the three-year-old daughter of my sound mixer, um, our voices doing different things. And like vocalizations? Yeah. Oh, like, wow. like, like t reading text and vocalizations oh, okay. and turn that into a synth palette for the score. So I mean, that was, that was a cool process. So it's all built on voices? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a couple of different instruments in there, but it's mostly it's mostly it's mostly my voice. Oh wow, that's a very personal touch. <laughs> yeah. um, so I just have one more question myself, and then maybe we'll see if anybody in the audience has questions about the movie. Um, I was wondering, so this was an independent production, right? It was. And independent films always have unique challenges that you don't necessarily expect. Was there anything like that that came up that was like way harder than you thought it would be? Oh yeah, um, this is a weird answer, but it was the Rescue Birds. If if y'all remember the, the TV show, you know, which takes place for like ten seconds of the movie, we wanted it to be the Wonder Pets. If anyone knows that show, uh, any parents and. Parents. and, and uh, the good people at Wonder Pets never called us back because they want nothing to do with this. <laughs> and, you know, we had gotten into Sundance. Uh, we had like two months to finish this movie. Yeah. And, uh, and we were like, oh, I guess we have to like write, animate, score, and produce a children's television show. And we did. <laughs> but it was definitely taxing. Like, uh, yeah, I think the Rescue Birds. The, the funny thing is, like, independent film, like the contract I negotiated for myself, I have like no rights to this film except for the merchandising rights, which I'm like, yeah, of course. Hey, like, make t-shirts. I mean, yeah. No, but I'm going to make a Wonder Pet spin or a Rescue Bird spin off. And that's, that's where I'm going to make all my money. That's, my <laughs> that's how George Lucas got rights was on merchandising rights. So I think it was the right idea. And um, just real quick, before I turn it over to the audience, just so everybody knows, this film uh, premiered at Sundance, and I'm, your turnaround was so fast, I'm really blown away by it. You shot in what, August 2022? Yeah, we wrapped September 28th, and we premiered in early, Jan I mean, mid-January at Sundance. That's a sprint. That is amazing. <laughs> so crazy. Yeah. So anybody out here have any questions for Laura about the film? Back here? I, I like it a lot, so thank you. Um, I'm just curious, so, there, you know, I feel like there, there could be a version of this that would be like very Tales from the Trip, right? Mm -hmm. Where like, I mean, it builds its way up to like basically a murder. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the end of the film, like, it's pretty ambiguous. Like, if they don't get caught, at least for now, it's not really like a big moral judgment. I mean, was that really important to you to, to kind of leave it that way? And did you, you know, did you go back and forth at any point of possibly having them get yeah, I think that's interesting because, you know, I mean, I don't know if I would call it like amoral, but it's that practicality we were talking about. There's this thread that runs through the film of non-judgment. Well, and, and I think I was just really interested in the characters and what they were going through and, and their relationship with each other. And so certainly it came up like, you know, they're living in a Bronx apartment. Why aren't they getting caught? Um, and 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 I was in a financing meeting where someone said, I like your movie, but what if there was a lady cop? And she was in the <laughs> and, 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 you know, so it's, so it's, so like, there's got to be a lady cop. Uh, I mean, I appreciate that he, that he wanted it to be a lady cop. Um, but, but, you know, 
I, I did feel like anything like that, that, any of that external pressure would have taken away from what I wanted to explore, which is like literally the relationship between these two women, how they sort of cross and, and, and become each other in a way and become dependent on each other. So yeah, I think ultimately we decided against um, the, adding that danger or pressure to the story. Over here. Down here? Yeah, uh, also love the movie. Um, maybe not the most interesting question, but I was curious about the thought behind sort of bookending the movie with uh, the, the movie starts sort of with that scene from close to the end. Mm -hmm. Sort of the mm -hmm. thought behind bookending the movie that way. So the question is like this, the cyclical nature of the movie. And yeah, the structure. Yeah. Um, yeah, that kind of came, that came kind of late. I think honestly it started off as a question of balance where like Emily wasn't introduced until very late into the movie and it felt a little sort of off kilter to sort of have her show up where she did. And even though obviously the audience doesn't know that she's showing up at the beginning, I think that's what propelled us to initially explore that idea. And then when we wrote it in, it just felt right. It just felt like um, this is a movie that is in so many ways about cycles and so you know, we wanted the structure of the movie to also kind of mirror the themes of the movie. Yeah. Like biological cycles or like yeah. death? Yeah, I mean, yeah, all, yeah. All of those, all of those. Like a, it's a circle movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Katie, down here. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, I noticed this and I wasn't sure, but was it intentional to have Rose have that look of Mary Shelley? Oh, cool. Uh, the question is, was it intentional to have Rose look like Mary Shelley? Thank you, you're doing uh, your job. Yeah, probably subliminally, yes. I will say that like, I shared a lookbook with Marin, and one of the photographs we were both really drawn to was this Frank Horvat, uh, like black and white photograph of this woman who was sort of contorted with this like wild black hair and glaring at the camera. And I think when Marin saw it, she, she, it was a real way in for her. So I think consciously it was very much that, but like, I love that. I'm gonna pretend that that was the idea. <laughs> um, do we have time for Yeah. Anybody else? Over here, yes, please. Okay, so how long, like, what were the casting to production? Yeah, like, we covered that the shooting and the editing happened quickly. Well, that happened quickly, but, um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we wrote this in, like, 2018. Uh, got into the Sundance Screenwriters Lab in January of 2020. The movie was greenlit in 2020 to, to go in the summer. A global pandemic happened. Um, <laughs> We attached Marin during that time, so I can't remember exactly, but I feel like in late 2020 is when I started really talking to her in earnest. Um, and we didn't come to Judy until we, we knew we were like getting to a window where we could actually film the movie, so that was 2022. We shot for 24 days in North Jersey, um, and then, yeah, we, like I said, we wrapped September 28th, turned it into Sundance October 31st, and then had to finish it over like every every single American holiday you can imagine. <laughs> so it was crazy. Well, that, I actually have a follow-up. So if you were talking to Marin for over a year before you shot, were you kind of rewriting and developing the character? Like, did you change anything based on your conversations with Marin? We didn't change a lot. I mean, it's funny, like there's one line that Marin requested we change, and it, and it's, and it's really wonky. It's like, you know, she's like, uh, blah, 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 stem cells, blah, 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 HLA markers. She added the line, you don't understand how hard it was to match with her. Cause she's like, no one's gonna understand your jargon. <laughs> <laughs> I need to say this out loud. Oh, so um, she's incorporating an explanation. She's like, you don't understand, this is hard. Um, but no, I mean, I think she really connected with the script and, and you know, the, the, the benefit the upside of sitting in your room for two years of COVID thinking about the movie is that like, you know, we were ready. You really get to think it through. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say let's do one more and then uh, we're good. Anybody else, anybody else? Back here. Yeah, back here. I believe you had your, with the ponytail? Hi. 
Yeah. Okay. So she's hungry. It seems like a choice to concentrate on the relationship rather than you know what would be more traditionally the horror of the mm. back half, yeah. the nurse going after more stem cells. Can you talk to us about like why you're focusing on the relationship rather than what would be more traditionally as like a horror version? Is that just how you do your work? Yeah, the question is, is, is sort of why focus on the relationship more, more than the horror elements of it. And I think, you know, um, yeah, I guess I'm more interested in that. I, I, I mean, I think there's nothing more horrifying than having a body. Um, and so I really, I was just like really attracted to those scenes in particular. And I'm not opposed to jump scares as a rule. I feel like, you know, they have their place and there are a lot of great horror films where they're really effective. But to me, I think, you know, one of the, one of the inspirations for this film was Todd Haynes' film, Safe. If anyone's seen it, it's a real medical thriller that just kind of like builds on this sense of dread. And, and I was hoping that, that that was kind of the feeling that we wanted to create in this movie. And, and I think sometimes like the more traditional horror um, devices can interfere with that. Well, I agree. There's nothing more horrifying than having a body. I mean, we all have one, so... Decades of material for you, I guess. <laughs> uh, I, I believe that's all we have time for, so let's all... One more time, big round of applause for Laura Moss! Thank you all so much for coming out to Burke.